Good afternoon and welcome to the 25th anniversary of the Lowell T. Kagashaw Lecture. It is my great pleasure to introduce you, first of all, to this lecture and secondly to our lecturer. This lecture, um, as you can tell from the title, is a lectureship in honor of Dr. Kagashal, who we will have an opportunity to hear more about uh, from today's speaker. But Dr. Kagashal, in addition to having served as chairman of our Department of Medicine, spent more than a decade serving as dean of the Division of Biological Sciences. It was during that period of time when Dr. Kagashal became known as the Dean of Deans. And he was invited by the Association of American Medical Colleges to chair what became a blue ribbon panel to outline the future of American medical education in this country. And so in 1965, with the support of the Association of American Medical Colleges and a grant from the Commonwealth Fund, Dr. Kagashal penned a very seminal report in medical education entitled, Planning for Medical Progress Through Education. In 1965, when that report was published, there was a second year medical student at the Pritzker School of Medicine named Dr. Mark Siegler, not yet a physician, but an honors graduate of Princeton University. <laughs> Dr. Siegler would go on to graduate from the Pritzker School of Medicine and complete a residency and chief residency in our Department of Medicine. That was then followed by a one-year stint in London, England at Hammersmith Hospital where he served as honorary senior registrar in medicine. Fourteen years later, after his initial appointment as instructor of medicine, he rose through the academic ranks to become professor of medicine, and since 2000, he has served as the Lindy Bergman Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine and Surgery. Dr. Siegler's first decade as a member of our faculty included him serving in many jobs simultaneously. He was the director of one of two inpatient general medicine services. He was the director of the medical intensive care unit of the medical consult service. He was the acting chief of general internal medicine, and he was the director of clinical ethics. In addition to his robust clinical service, Dr. Siegler was also a very active and engaged teacher. During the decade from 1982 to 1992, he was the director of the history taking and physical diagnosis course, a course in which I was the student sitting in the classroom with Dr. Siegler as my teacher. In 1991, he took over the directorship of the doctor-patient relationship course, a course that he continues to serve as co-director today with Dr. David Rubin. And in 2014, one year ago, he invented a brand new course through his work with the Buxbaum Institute on becoming a doctor. In 2011, Dr. Siegler became the founding executive director of the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence after a $42 million gift was given by the Matthew and Carolyn Buxbaum Family Foundation. And 30 years ago, in 1984, the University of Chicago established the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. Today, this center is the largest clinical ethics program in the world, having trained more than 300 physicians and other health professionals. It has trained the directors of many clinical ethics programs around the world, including centers in throughout the United States and in Canada, Europe, and China. In 2013, the McLean Center received the Cornerstone Award from the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities for outstanding contributions from an institution that has shaped the field of bioethics. In addition to Dr. Siegler's very active and busy clinical schedule, he continues to be an avid writer. 
His textbook, Clinical Ethics, A Practical Approach to Ethical Decisions in Clinical Medicine, is now in its eighth edition, having been translated into nine languages. In addition to that textbook, he has written four other books. He has authored 50 book chapters and more than 200 journal articles. In fact, it would be a lecture in itself for me to detail the many papers that Dr. Siegler has authored covering a vast array of topics in medicine and in medical education. But for the purposes of today, I will highlight only one, a paper published in 1992 in the journal Academic Medicine. That paper entitled, The Future of American Medical Education, The Legacy of Lowell T. Kagashal. And so I think it is only fitting and appropriate that there is one man whose name is associated with clinical medical ethics in the world. There are many fine bioethicists who come from the fields of philosophy, law, political science, sociology, religion, among many other fields. But there is only one name associated with clinical medical ethics who is a physician. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Siegler, who will speak on 50 extraordinary years at the University of Chicago and the development of clinical medical ethics. That's a, an impossible introduction to live up to, Holly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to begin by, by thanking Dean Polanski. Can, can you hear me up there in the back? Good. Uh, Dean Polanski and Dean Holly Humphrey and uh, Dr. Everett Vokes for inviting me to present the 25th Lowell T. Coggeshall Memorial Lecture. Uh, this lecture focuses on medical education and recognizes Dean Lowell Coggeshall's many great contributions uh, to medical education. Um, the, the title of the lecture is the one that Holly told you, 50 Extraordinary Years at the University and the Development of Clinical Medical Ethics. I, I want to begin by also thanking Dean Coggeshall's three children for coming today. They've traveled from Massachusetts, California, and Texas to be here, and I deeply appreciate your coming and your wonderful support of this lectureship over the past 25 years. I, I ask the audience to join me in recognizing Carol Govan, Diane Zink, and Dr. Rich Richard Kagashal. I'm, I'm also delighted that two of our four children, Dylan and Allison, are able to be here. Uh, my wife, Anna, and Nicole Duchenne, uh, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my, my remarks today will, will cover these three topics. Um, I will begin by talking about the history of the medical school and the biological sciences division, and by examining the contributions of two important leaders of the division, Dean Lowell Coggeshall and the founding dean, uh, Franklin McLean. Uh, dean Coggeshall was born in 1901 in Saratoga, Indiana. He graduated from Indiana University Medical School, came to the University of Chicago as an intern in 1928 and stayed on the faculty until 1935. He specialized in infectious diseases and was a malaria expert. During World War II, Dr. Kagashal served as the chief advisor to the US government's malaria project. He was asked to develop a safe, effective, once a week malaria prophylaxis, which he did by combining high doses of chloroquine and primaquine. After the war, Dr. Kagashal was recruited back to the university by President Robert Hutchins and served as Dean of the Biological Sciences from 1947 to 1960. As Holly said, during his term as Dean, 
Dr. Kagashaw was known in academic circles as the Dean of Deans. While Dean, Dr. Kagashaw moved easily and frequently between Chicago and Washington, D.C., and was a special advisor on health matters uh, to both Presidents Eisenhower and Nixon. In 1956, in fact, he moved for a year to Washington to serve as a special advisor on health uh, to President Eisenhower. Uh, Holly has already mentioned the 1965 report that he authored on planning for medical progress through education. One of Dr. Kagashal's greatest contributions was that he changed the AAMC from a small regional dean's club whose headquarters was actually close by in Evanston, Illinois, and moved it to Washington, D.C., uh, to make it the powerful and effective voice for academic medicine that it, is, uh, that it remains today. I, I first met Dean Kagashal and his wife, Becky, in Foley, Alabama in 1967. I'm embarrassed about that, but actually it was while I was on my honeymoon, <laughs> our honeymoon. <laughs> I, I, I had written Dr. Kagashal to ask if I could drop by to talk about some of the early history of the medical school <laughs> and, and about Franklin McLean, uh, the first dean, and Dr. Kagashal and Becky graciously extended an invitation. Anna sometimes still chides me that even on our honeymoon, I was working. Uh, in, in preparing for this lecture um, and thinking about Dean Kagashal, I came to realize that during my 50 years at the university, I have personally known every dean since the founding of the medical school in 1923 with the exception of three deans. I, I note them here, De Richard Scammon, Frank Lilly, and William Talaferro, who were the deans between 1931 and 1943. So of the 19 BSD deans and acting deans since 1923, I have personally known 16. Uh, let me highlight just a few of these individuals. Uh, H. Stanley Bennett, was the dean when I arrived on campus for medical school in September of 1963. Leon Jacobson, uh, to his long-standing regret, signed my first faculty appointment in 1971. <laughs> Sam Hellman was my friend and colleague and consultant on tough cancer problems for many years. Uh, Godfrey Getz was, for me, a role model on how one could successfully integrate scientific research with the medical humanities. Glenn Steele and I taught a course together for five years. Glenn is now running the Geisinger system in Pennsylvania. Jim Adera uh, is now the executive, chief executive officer at the AMA. Ev Vokes and I have been friends and colleagues stretching back for many years. And Ken and I go back uh, at least 30 years. We were friends and neighbors on Blackstone Avenue. Um, and our friendship was solidified during the two years uh, each of our section offices were being renovated. And we were both exiled to a part of the hospital that I venture to say very few of you have ever seen. It was 0600. Raise your hand if you've ever been to 0600. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm taken aback, yes. Um, in the far farthest reaches of the old hospital. Now, I suppose it isn't strange that, that after 50 years on campus, I would have known many of the deans. But one really surprising thing is, despite my apparent youth, I actually knew Franklin McLean, <laughs> who founded this medical school in 1923, 91 years ago. I knew Dr. McLean because as a senior medical student and then later as an intern and a resident, I was assigned on five separate occasions to care for him during admissions to the hospital. Uh, let me show you a picture of me, my graduation picture, <laughs> 1967. This is the man my, my wife married in 1967. 
Ju just two years later, as a medical resident, I have to show you the other picture. <laughs> Uh, Anna said, where is the man I married? I responded, hey, this is the late 60s. <laughs> uh, but, but Dr. McLean and I we would sometimes talk about the history of the medical school and this wonderful book that he had co-authored with Ilse Vith, an historian, a, a book written in 1952 on the 25th anniversary of the medical school. I call this this wonderful book to your attention. Dr. McLean was born in Moroa, Illinois in 1888, actually on February 29 of 1888. He always enjoyed the distinction of the unusual leap year birth date. I show you here on the left side, in the middle, picture of Dr. McLean uh, in 1892 at the age of four or as he would put it, at the age of one, uh, because of leap year. And, and then on the right-hand side, I show you a picture of Dr. McLean and his uh, sister, uh, Louise McLean Gentle, uh, who, who lived until 2001 and dying at the age of 109. Um, now, these photos were sent to me by Mr. Bob Gentle. Bob is the son of Dr. McLean's sister, Louise, um, and, and Mr. Gentle and his wife uh, and their daughter, Rita, uh, have driven here today from Moroa, Illinois, to be in the audience. Please join me in welcoming them. Like, like Lowell Coggeshall, Franklin McLean was a distinguished academic leader. In, in 1914, while still an assistant professor, uh, McLean was chosen uh, for his, he, I, I show him in the circle down here, was chosen for his intellectual and organizational skills and was sent by the Rockefeller Foundation to become the founding dean at the Peking Union Medical College, PUMC, which was the first Western medical school in China. In 1923, the, the Rockefeller Foundation, which was a great supporter of this new medical school that we were developing, um, encouraged university president Harry Judson to bring McLean back from China and to appoint him as the founding dean of the new medical school here at the university. Now, McLean's vision for Chicago was similar to this building that he built at PUMC. And that vision, which is really quite unique, was to have the outpatient clinic, the inpatient beds, the laboratories of a group, and the offices of each specialty localized geographically within the hospital to create a system that has never, had never before existed in the US, and as far as I know, has never been replicated. Um, th th this is a slide of the original floor plan of Billings Hospital, um, wh where th this integration that I talked about took place. This is the fifth floor. Um, and you see that there's an M, M wing for medicine, an S wing for surgery, an A wing for administration, and we are currently in P117, the pathology wing. So we are sitting in the old, original hospital uh, that opened in 1927. Um, now, what were some of McLean's other innovations, uh, innovations that helped define the medical school that we are celebrating today? Um, first of all, he created a true university medical school completely integrated intellectually and geographically with its parent university. He established a medical school that was not a separate professional school, but was part of the Ogden School and later the Division of Biological Sciences, thus integrating basic sciences and clinical practice. McLean and, and the people he worked with assured that the university would own and would operate its own teaching hospital. He helped establish the full-time system where faculty are salaried employees of the university and have no clinical duties unrelated to the university. 
Dr. McLean emphasized research, particularly research closely linked to teaching and clinical care, and he developed a subspecialty system, which started when the Billings Hospital opened in 1927. Now, many of Franklin McLean's innovations remain part of the organization and philosophy of our current medical school and the BSD. This picture, which is the front of, of Billings Hospital, reminds me of one other vitally important decision uh, by McLean. The original architectural plans for this hospital called for it to be located uh, south of the Midway on the corner of 60th and Ellis, where Burton Judson now stands. And McLean insisted that the, that the building be relocated or resited to the north side of the Midway, where it currently is, in order to be closer to the main university campus and to the whole biological laboratories, which were then the basic science labs. I show you a modern picture, so modern, in fact, that you can see the CCD over here, but showing this incredible geographic integration between the medical complex uh, to the west and the main university campus uh, to the east. Uh, this integration still holds. Um, I'm, I'm gonna turn away now from, from Mc, Drs. Kagashal and McLean, and the second, in the second part of my remarks, I, I would like to talk about my debt to the University of Chicago. When I entered medical school in 63, I was delighted to become part of the scholarly environment that had been established by Franklin McLean and carried forward by McLean's successors, including Dean Lowell Kagashal. I, I think back now on the great teachers I had during medical school, basic scientists, clinic, clinicians, and ethicists. In later years, most of this extraordinary group of faculty became my senior colleagues and mentors as I grew up and worked to develop an academic career here at the university. Here are the pictures of some of the great basic scientists who were my teachers in medical school and afterwards. Uh, Charlie Huggins and Janet Rowley, Don Steiner, Leon Jacobson, Jean Goldwasser, Arthur Rubenstein, Albert Dorfman, Elwood Jensen, Bob Whistler, Frank Fitch, Ruth Rines, and Joe Seidhamel. It, it was Ruth Rines and Joe Seidhamel who uh, pioneered to keep me in medical school. And I, thought, I always thought that Dean Seidhamel had an ulterior motive because by then he and I were playing squash together on a regular basis. Uh, but in addition to these spectacular basic science teachers, I had wonderful clinical teachers and mentors. Rory Childers, who sadly died just a month ago, George Block, Joe Barron, who I saw in the back, Joe, uh, Lloyd, uh, Lou Cohn, Lloyd Ferguson, Joe Kersner. JBK gave this lecture, the Kagashaw Lecture in 2006, when he was 97 years old. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Bob Replogle, in whose lab I worked for two summers during medical school. Henry Russi, uh, who was my advisor from day one of medical school. John Altman, Al Tarlov. Um, it's an extraordinary group. And when, I th and when I turned to ethics, the Chicago campus in the 70s had four of the leading bioethicists in the world um, on the campus. Jim Gustafson had come here from Yale in 1972 and was one of the founders of the American bioethics movement. Uh, Father Dick McCormick, uh, who from 1957 to 74 was on the faculty of the Jesuit School of Theology in Hyde Park and was regarded then and later as the leading Catholic bioethicist in the country. Leon Cass and Stephen Toulman joined the Committee on Social Thought in the mid-1970s. I can't imagine any university in the world, in the 60s, 70s, or since, that has had comparable strength to Chicago's in basic science, clinical medicine, and bioethics. In, in preparing for this talk, I, I thought back on three important turning points in my career, one, one involving Al Tarloff, the, the chair of medicine in the department, another one involving Arthur Rubenstein when he was the chair of medicine, 
and the final one involving Hannah Gray when she was president of the university. Um, I, I wonder if you would indulge me just a couple of minutes to tell you the stories. The, the, the first story involved Al. Uh, I, I, I had a meeting with Al in June of 72 to figure out my new assignments. I was joining the faculty in his, as an assistant professor. And um, uh, Al said, well, you know, we've got this new division of general medicine. It only has two people, you and Dick Binney, who is the chief, and we'll have an A and a B service. Dick will run A, you'll run B. You'll each attend for eight months of the year, and, and we'll figure out who'll do the other attending. Uh, other faculty, chief residents, and like. Um, I said, yeah, I, I understand that. And then Al said, and, and Dick, Dick has agreed to do all the house staff programs in the department, and so I'll assume that you'll do all the student programs, the junior clerkships, the, the, the senior electives, and like. I said, fine. I was almost ready to get out of the office when Al said, I've got another idea. Uh, I, think, I think we should have a general medicine consult service um, and you know, be available to, to consult to surgeons, ob anybody who calls us. No one will call us, don't worry. And <laughs> you, you can be the director of that and attend for 12 months of the year. So I was totally up. By, by then I had 20, 20 attending months, eight and 12. And now, now I had my hand on the doorknob, and I was really just about out when Al said, Mark, I got one more idea. I was, I was worried already. He said, you know, we need a medical intensive care unit. <laughs> I said, Al, what is a medical intensive care unit? You gotta understand. In, in 1972, there were no medical intensive care units in Chicago. There was none here at the hospital. Um, there, were, there were no good ventilators. We had these old pressure vents. Uh, there was no specialty of critical care. It didn't emerge until the early 80s. So I said, Al, uh, what does that mean? He said, well, we'll break down a couple of walls on W5 upstairs. And he said, uh, we'll, we'll have a unit where five or six people will come, the sickest people in the hospital. and." Uh, Everything okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the sickest people in the hospital, and we'll monitor them, and maybe we can do something. So I, um, he, and he said, no one will come again. No, no one will come. <laughs> and you can be the director. Now I was, I was holding back to find out how many more attending months. He said, you can attend for 12 months. So now I was up to 32 months or something. Uh, so so that, that was my first job uh, in the department. Uh, but the important thing was during the five years in which I directed the medical ICU from 72 to 76, every important ethical issue came up. End of life care, rationing beds, truth telling, informed consent, medical innovation, because everything we did, uh, we did without a rule book. Um, all of the ethical issues were there, and I discovered at that time that there was very little literature on this range of everyday problems that I could show to my students or residents uh, in, in the ICU. And so those five years in the ICU were really important for me. And that's where I found my focus and my career direction, and those were the years when I decided to spend my career trying to improve patient care by combining ethical analysis with clinical medical practice. Um, the second story I want to tell is about uh, when Arthur and I had submitted a proposal um, to the Mellon Foundation uh, asking for support of a center of a medical ethics he here in the Department of Medicine. Um, and um, uh, we, we were to meet, in, in, we were invited to meet in New York with the president of the foundation, um, John Sawyer, and Arthur and I went with great excitement uh, to find out that Mr. Sawyer had unexpectedly been called away. And we were, uh, we were placed in the hands of, of an associate of Mr. Sawyer's, um, um, uh, who, um, who I don't think really recognized that we were coming that day and hadn't read our proposal, but who gave us a very hard time. Um, uh, Arthur and I, I remember, left the meeting standing on the corner of 62nd and Lexington Avenue and saying, 
this was not one of the highlights of our career. Um, and we better think of alternative funding sources for the center. Um, but you know, I'm glad we came here and, and tried. Um, on December 24th of that same year, three months later, I received in the mail the thinnest of envelopes. Uh, an envelope, the, the kind you get when you're rejected from college. You know, <laughs> that, that really thin, paper thin envelope. And with the Mellon return address on it. And I was almost inclined not to read it because, I mean, I knew what it was going to say. And I opened it up to discover that, in fact, it was not a letter. It was a check. It's a check made out for $500,000 to me, personally. <laughs> December 24th. So I quickly get on the phone to call the Mellon Foundation. They're closed for the holidays. So I reach Arthur, and Arthur says, whatever you do, don't cash the check. <laughs> which, which I followed the wise counsel. Uh, but, um, but, but, but that was... Uh, that was so important. The early funding from the Mellon Foundation was crucial. Um, it, it enabled us to go forward with, with Mellon's support. And in our first 10 years, uh, we, we got strong support from the Pew Charitable Trust in Philadelphia, the Henry Kaiser Family Foundation in California. And at that time, we were fortunate that the McLean family became closely involved and, and supportive of our work. I, I have to reduce some confusion at the outset. The Mac Franklin McLean and the McLean family, so far as we know, have no family relationship. Although I learned last night, they both probably came from the Scottish island of Mull originally, and they changed the spelling of the names and whatever. But, but so two, two different families. The third turning point I want to talk about was a meeting with Hannah Gray, who is president of the university. Hannah is here today. Hannah, <laughs> <Did you> get <laughs> oh. I, I, was, I was struggling with, with a job offer from an Eastern University that in those days had the only endowed chair in medical ethics in the country. And, um, and Arthur and I had talked about it at some length, and Arthur asked Mrs. Gray if I could go over and, and meet with her, and, and she graciously said yes. And I went over, we had a good conversation, at the end of which Hannah said, there really is only one important question, and that is, at which of these two institutions can you better achieve your career goals? And once the question was put so clear, clearly as that, the answer was immediate. I went home to talk to my wife uh, to, to make sure that, I, that we agreed on it, and we totally did, that, that Chicago was where I wanted to be. And, um, and I've never once regretted that decision, and, and there were three or four reasons that just jumped to mind as soon as the question was laid out. Chicago was a true university, uh, unified geographically and intellectually, committed and enthusiastic about interdisciplinary work. Second, I loved working with patients, and I had been in practice at that point about 20 years, and I just didn't want to leave my patient population. Third, I had been working in the area of clinical ethics here at the university at that point uh, for 10 or 12 years, and my plans were supported and encouraged by my colleagues, by the department leadership, by the university. And finally, my mentors were here, Al Tarloff, Arthur Rubinstein, Leif Sorensen, Jim Gustafson, Stephen Toulman, and Hannah Gray. And they were willing uh, to guide me in my early years uh, as I worked to develop my career. And, and when I thought of those reasons, um, as I say, I, I made a pretty much quick decision with Anna that evening and have ne never regretted it at all. Th this brings me now to the final portion of my talk, um, and that is the question about the development of clinical medical ethics. And we start with the question, what is clinical medical ethics? Let me say that there are many definitions of it, but hey, we invented it so we get to define it. <laughs> Clinical ethics is a new and practical field 
that applies ethics and ethical analysis to improve patient care and outcomes. And at the same time, to improve the engagement and satisfaction of clinicians with their work. Clinical ethics focuses on the doctor-patient relationship and helps patients, families, and physicians reach good clinical decisions that take account both of the medical facts of the case and, as, as well, the patient's preferences and values. In 2014, to be a competent clinician, physicians must understand and use the concepts of clinical ethics, these issues like truth-telling, informed consent, confidentiality, privacy, decisional capacity, and end-of-life care are simply part and parcel of what doctors do. Um, as I said, the, the McLean Center is, is seen as the birthplace of clinical ethics. Over the years, the achievements of the McLean Center have very much been a team effort. I want to recognize and thank the McLean family for their unswerving support for the past 30 years. Uh, th this is a picture of the late Dorothy Jean D.J. McLean in the middle uh, with ba her son Barry and daughter-in-law Mary Ann. Um, and and D.J., who really was the force behind the McLean family getting involved with us, always believed that education was the best way to improve the world. And throughout her life, her philanthropy supported many leading educational institutions, including Yale, Dartmouth, her own alma mater, Colorado College, and fortunately for us, the University of Chicago. Um, following DJ's lead, uh, Barry and Marianne served as co-chairs of the McLean Center's advisory board from 1984 to earlier this year. Barry and Marianne, for 30 years, helped guide the center in achieving its mission and expanding its work. And under their leadership, uh, the center has developed a substantial endowment, including uh, five endowed chairs to support activities related to clinical medical ethics. And in April of 2014, we were delighted to announce that Rachel Kohler, a longstanding member of the McLean Center Board, had become the new chair of the board, and we look forward to working with, Ra with Rachel as the McLean Center moves ahead in its work. Rachel, thank you. Um, the McLean Center has also been fortunate to have a superb team of associate directors, both in its early years and currently. Early on, Steve Miles joined the McLean Center soon after it started and helped it get launched. And John Lantos was one of the earliest fellows at the center and stayed on for, for many years to help me direct the center. And here, is, here are our current uh, McLean Center associate directors. Lainey Ross has been teaching me as a colleague and friend. <laughs> what happened? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to Marshall Dad in a minute. Uh, uh, Lainey, Lainey has been teaching me as a colleague and friend since she arrived 20 years ago from the East Coast and then also mainly from Princeton. Um, Peter Angelos, uh, an endocrine surgeon, joined us six years ago to develop a new program in surgical ethics five years ago. <laughs> Gosh. Dan Solmezi um, came from New York to add expertise in internal medicine, ethics, and end-of-life care. And most recently, Marshall, Marshall is here. <laughs> Marshall joined us to help build our program in ethics and health policy. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Tracy Kugler and Dan Brauner, who now direct the center's consultation program. And I want to especially recognize Ann Dudley Goldblatt, who for 30 years directed the center's program in ethics, law, and medicine. Join me in thanking all of them. The center has an outstanding interdisciplinary faculty 
from the BSD, the Law School, the Divinity School, the Booth School, and from the Humanities and Social Sciences. I apologize uh, that you can't read this, but I, I call your attention to the red names because 60% of the center faculty listed in red are graduates of the center's fellowship training program. Uh, on the next slide, I show you some of the current faculty who have completed fellowship training at the McLean Center. Shola Olapati, Emily Landon, Melanie Brown, Peter Angelos, Salvi Fetson, Larry Gottlieb, Bill Meadow, Chris Dougherty, Milda Saunders, David Rubin. I know some of them are in the audience. I want to thank you guys and all the other fellows. My, my point here is to emphasize uh, the, the amazing team effort that has helped the McLean Center grow. I feel so fortunate to have worked for 30 years with superb and talented co colleagues and with a great advisory board. Um, I'd like now to just touch briefly uh, on some of the McLean Center's achievements and contributions, both locally and nationally. Uh, we helped develop a, a medical ethics fellowship training program, which became the signature program of the McLean Center. Um, as Holly has said, we've now trained more than 350 fellows, uh, almost 300 physician fellows, 30 of whom went on to direct ethics programs in the US and abroad. More than 25 of our former fellow trainees have held endowed professorships, and, and the fellows have come from nine or 10 foreign countries, uh, including the ones that I show on the slide. Um, second, we helped establish clinical ethics consultations. Beginning in 1984, the University of Chicago was among the first hospitals, uh, universities in, in the world um, to offer formal ethics consultations. Our faculty and fellows helped write much of the early literature and develop models for ethics consultations. We have now consulted on more than 2,500 cases in the past 35 years, and despite the complexity and conflicts that often lead to an ethics consult being called, as far as we know, no lawsuits have resulted from any of the 2,500 cases seen by our consultation teams. Um, third, we, as I mentioned, Peter Angelos came to help create a new field of surgical ethics. In the six years since Peter came from Northwestern, the center has trained more than 30 surgeons in our fellowship program. And we have, um, we, we have published uh, in the ethics and medical ethics literature. Uh, current and former fellows have published thousands of peer-reviewed journal articles, and I love to say more than 150 books. This is not a contemporary picture of me, as some of you know. Um, let, let me now turn to the question of the impact of clinical ethics on US medicine. During the past 40 years, uh, a number uh, of the developments that I will mention were strongly influenced by clinical ethics in the McLean Center. By, by no means do we claim re exclusive responsibility for some of the big changes that have occurred in US medicine, but we're proud to have played a role in, in some of the changes. Um, the, the first one I, I refer to is ethics committees, particularly ethics consultation services. In contrast to the 1970s and early 1980s, every large hospital in the US now has an ethics committee or an ethics consult service to address clinical ethical issues and to help develop institutional ethics policies. In fact, as you know, the Joint Commission now requires that hospitals have a mechanism for resolving ethical problems. Second, um, again in contrast to the 70s and early 80s, uh, essentially every major medical organization now has an ethics committee and a code of ethics. Third, scholarly papers in clinical ethics, many of them empirical, data-driven papers, are now published regularly both in bioethics journals as well as in standard medical journals. Fourth, the doctor-patient relationship in a generation of tremendous clinical, political, economic changes, 
I think that clinical ethics has been one of the forces that has helped maintain the focus on the doctor-patient relationship and on shared decision-making. In fact, it was based on the 1982 recommendations of the President's Bioethics Commission that shared decision-making became the prevailing model in the U.S. for the doctor-patient relationship. And that 1982 commission report that I show you here drew heavily on the work that we had been doing at the McLean Center. And finally, finally, something I call the democratization of clinical ethics. I think this may be the most important national contribution. Clinical ethics discussions have become a part of the everyday clinical conversation that occurs in outpatient and inpatient settings across the country. In fact, issues, as I say, like truth-telling, confidentiality, informed consent, and end-of-life care are so completely integrated in, into the practice that these days physicians don't think of themselves as, quote, doing ethics, but rather see themselves as doing medicine. It's sort of like realizing we've been speaking prose all our lives. You know, this notion of, of doing medicine and doing ethics. You no longer have to be an ethicist to do clinical ethics. You just have to be a doc. And, and that's what I'm referring to here as the democratization of clinical ethics. And so to conclude, uh, looking back after 50 extraordinary years at the university, the things that I'm proudest of are working with great students, residents, and faculty colleagues, taking care of patients as a general internist for 47 years, helping to start the general medicine section, organizing the first medical ICU at the university, helping to start the field of clinical medical ethics, and working with faculty colleagues and board members for the past 30 years to develop the McLean Center and the Ethics Fellowship Training Program. But I'm not old enough yet to hang up my spurs, and I'm ready to look forward. And uh, looking forward, I'll tell you that in 2011, Dean Polanski invited me to direct the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. The Buxbaum Institute, as Holly pointed out, is a new program in the BSD made possible by a transformative gift from Kay and her husband, the late Matthew Buxbaum, and their family. The Buxbaum Institute is dedicated to all the things that I have dedicated my career to, the doctor-patient relationship, improving patient care and outcomes through research and teaching, improving communication with patients, improving the process of decision-making. Let me say once again how fortunate I have been to have such wonderful colleagues, students, and patients uh, who have made these past 50 years truly extraordinary. In closing, I want to express my deepest gratitude to the university, to the Biological Sciences Division, and to the Department of Medicine for tolerating unconventional ideas and for providing the kind of intellectual environment that allows new ideas to develop and flourish. Thank you very much. understanding of our history, of our culture um, here at the university and the department. What do you think in times where everything is changing are the things we need to preserve the most? I think we have to preserve the, 
those elements that, that have been part of the tradition of medicine for its history. Um, the, the relationship between the patient and these days, not, not just the individual doctor, but the, the team taking care of the patient becomes so important. Uh, often an interprofessional team made up of doctors, nurses, and, and other healthcare professionals. Um, but I think the elements of that interaction, the communication, the decision-making process, the compassion, the empathy that people express uh, have to be preserved. And, and, and I am optimistic. I'm optimistic, I mean, I, you know, from the time I started, from the time I started 50 years ago, uh, Medicare and Medicaid was passed when I was a, a senior, a junior and senior in medical school. And everybody said that was the end of medicine as we knew it, all right? Medicine would never be the same. And in fact, as you know, medicine has gone through a golden year transition. I mean, a generation and a half that has been spectacular in terms of research and care and improved abilities to treat and care for patients. And it has retained those fundamentals. So, so that's my hope for the future and frankly, my optimistic expectation for the future. So, um, Mark, not that the Coggershaw Lecture is not uh, enough, it's more than enough, um, but we also want to give you the Department's Distinguished Service Award. Oh my gosh. Uh, for uh, a long career in the Department, and uh, many, many thanks for everything you've done for us and uh, our faculty, our students. Thank you so much. Patients. Thank you. I didn't know that.